First Timothy chapter 3 from verse 14. It says, but I'm writing these things to you that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth. How you ought to behave yourself in society, how you ought to behave yourself, all right, in your workplace, how you ought to behave yourself. So he makes a distinction between what we call our nature and our nurture. All right, our nature being what was accomplished on the cross. What did Jesus do for us on the cross? All right, and if people don't, are not careful to make this distinction, you'll find people who stress nurture outside nature, and what you have is legalism. And then you have people who stress nature as though nurture were unnecessary, and what you have is lasciviousness. Are you following what I'm saying here? The balance is to understand that we have received a nature in Christ Jesus, but that nature must be nurtured. There's, there's some character, some conduct that is expected of that life that we have received in Christ Jesus. So he says, I want you to know how you ought to behave yourself. There is what is expected. There is what the Father is looking out for. Now, in verse 16, he then adds a, another statement, which I believe is very powerful. If he had ended it there, and he said that, that you may know how you ought to behave yourself, then he would have reduced conduct to just basically be, behavioral modi modification, which is just modify your behavior, be moral, do the right things, all right? Ensure that you keep the words of the law, whatever it is, and you will be fine. But we know full well that Christianity is not behavioral modification. It's not about your behavior being modified. Would that happen in true Christianity? Yes. But is that the goal of Christianity? No. All right? It's not just, you know, I think his message translation, it says that these words are not homeowner improvements where, you know, I mean, you, you get a house and then you do, a, I mean, just some little improvement here and there that when we get saved, it's not just a renovation of our lives. It's called a new birth. Are you following what I'm saying here? Which means we, 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 we receive the life of God into our spirit. Please listen very carefully tonight. Um, we're going to touch around three major things. Um, number one, doctrine. A lot of doctrine. A lot of eschatological stuffs are going to be touched. And a lot of principles for living. So it's a robust meal tonight. Please listen. Yeah, you, we're going to touch doctrine because you can't talk about the mystery of godliness without you having the right foundation of doctrine. What many people are trying to do in um, talking about consecration and holiness and things like that, they are trying to separate um, what Christ has done, the fullness of what Christ has done, and the impact it should have on us. And that's where people get into problems. And then you have people, on the other hand, who um, tr make you almost feel as though any form of thing, anything that you do, when it, um, any conversation around con consecration and holiness is legalism. And that's not true. There's a balance that must be found. Are you following what I'm saying here? So you find Paul treading carefully like a master, um, like an artist there. He starts out by saying, I'm writing these things to you that you may know how you ought to behave yourself. Anybody picks that up and says, yes, that's what I've been saying. It's important that we behave ourselves aright. This is the issue we have with the body of Christ. People are not behaving themselves aright. But then he goes to the next verse and look at what he says in verse 16. He says, and without controversy, great is what? The mystery of godliness. Now, when you read this in the King James, it, it's a bit blind to you. In the NIV, that first sentence says something very powerful. It says, without argument, without controversy, without any doubt, without, I mean, I don't know if we have it. Um, 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 it says, beyond, beyond all question, it says, the mystery from which true godliness springs forth. So true godliness springs forth from a certain kind of truth. Are you following what I'm saying here? It's not just behavioral modification, me trying to be a moral person and all the rest. Uh -uh. It says true godliness actually springs forth from a body of truth, which when a person has received, understands it and light comes to him, it says godliness becomes the 
um, literally the end product of that thing. That's why in Romans 6, chapter, Paul writing to the Romans, he said something. He says that you have received this form of doctrine that has been delivered unto you that has now freed you from sin and made you slaves unto righteousness. We'll look into it in just a bit. So he says there's a form of truth, a body of truth, doctrine that you have received. Having received it, he said it has freed you from sin and made you a slave unto righteousness. The problem many a times is people think that godliness will spring forth from decisions. All right, if I decide I'm not going to do this, this is the way I want my life to look. And they think that, you know, by strong will power, and then if I make strong decisions, then I will be able to do these things. But what the Bible says is that this godliness we are talking about actually springs forth from a mystery, an understanding, which is if you have this understanding, the fruit of it that we will see in your life is godliness. Is somebody following what I'm saying here? And you see... He calls it the mystery of godliness, and you're going to see in just a bit why he calls it the mystery of godliness, and because we're going to contrast it with another mystery in scriptures very soon, and you will see what is actually expected of the church in the last days. Two things, and if you, if you, if you need to know this, two things that God is doing in the last days in the body of Christ. Number one, he is presenting unto himself, Jesus is presenting unto himself a church without spot and without blemish. Two things. And number two, that the gospel of the kingdom will be preached to all nations. These are the two agenda of God. When Jesus returns, he's not going to return for the car you parked outside. He's not. Listen, everything we give as testimony, or let me, let me put it this way, 90% of the things that we give as testimony and we celebrate, none of it has eternal value. I hope you understand what I said. That's not to say that it's not important. If you get a job today, I hope you know that in and of itself, that job has no eternal value. Which means in the scheme of things, you can't take that job to heaven. Now, there's a way and manner in which you can conduct yourself and tie your job to kingdom purposes and then it has eternal value. But at face value by itself, it has no eternal value. You walk down to the store, there many of you are looking real, prim, proper, um, mascara and all the rest. You know, by the time you are raptured, we will remove all the makeup so we can see the real person that is raptured. I hope you know, make, you, you will, they will use divine, what they call it? Um, wipe, swipe. Is it swipe or wipes? They will wipe you. Are you following what I'm saying? It's, it's in, the Bible says immortality will be swallowed up. Do you think that your glorified body needs mascara? No, everything will be removed. All these things, somebody looks at you and says, you look so beautiful. Everything, none of it has eternal value. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? Yes, what God is doing, and if you don't know this, we might run a race and then find out that, listen, it was just a foot race at the end of the day. What he's doing, what he's, the concerted effort of the Father, hear me, is not to bring prosperity to the church. There are wells of prosperity that has been dug in the church already. If it's about healing revival, somebody says we are believing God for healing revival, let me tell you this, there are wells of healing revivals, waves of glory that already have been dug in the church. There is almost no blessing, no dimension of God, sincerely speaking, that we're looking for that a generation has not tasted in a form, are you getting what I'm saying here? And basically what we are doing is that we are redigging the wells that people have drunk from, from in the years past. What is God doing? doing in the last day. Number one, he's presenting to himself. There's a work that God is doing to present to himself a church without spot and without blemish. And then number two, that church is raised in power, granted new vision to ensure that the gospel of the kingdom is preached to every nation. Are you following what I'm saying here? So when we talk about the mystery of godliness, we're talking about the work that God did, the, the work of the cross, and the effect that he has in our immediate life, your conduct, your life, how, how you conduct yourself, your conversation, the effect that he has. Are we, is it possible? Does the cross have an effect on our lives? Absolutely so. It says, great is the mystery of godliness. 
without question, without controversy. It says, this godliness springs forth not from willpower. Are you get what I'm saying here? Not from, I've made up my mind, this is what I want to do. Uh -uh. Many of you will agree with me. There are times you said to God, maybe somebody was dealing with a struggle in their lives, and then you said, oh God, if I ever do it again, kill me. How many of you, you no, you don't have to. Uh, you gonna, if I ever lie again, kill me. If I ever, if I ever. Now, I mean, I know most of you, you were born holy. And when they gave birth to you, there were three angels wearing diapers and wings and all the rest. I understand that. But many of you were born in sin, in iniquity. Did your mother conceive you? And you will find yourself, oh God, in God, in the name of you, just kill me. I, prom I give you my word. You even come to the altar. You wail, you cry. And all the after a while, do you realize you don't even pray those prayers anymore? You're like, well, you're the God of many chances. I mean, and then you suddenly heard the message that the love of God is overwhelming. The love of God is radical. And he gave you some, ha, ah, hey, I can't be killing myself now. The love of God has covered for all of these things. Now, please, there's, I understand what that is saying. <laughs> but there's another aspect I need to give to you so that you, are, is, you cannot have a coin. I've said this over and over again. Every truth must have two sides. Every truth. Every truth must have two sides. There must be something to counterbalance it. Not to negate it, but to counterbalance it. Which means once you are studying the scripture and light is coming to you on something and you are getting excited about it, you have to start searching for what is the truth in scriptures that counterbalances this thing. If you don't find the counterbalance, you will enter excess. Is somebody following me tonight? Yes, so let's go back to 1 Timothy 3.16. Look at what it says. Let me read the NIV very quickly, that first sentence there, and then we come back to the King James there. It says, beyond all question, the mystery from which what? True godliness springs is what? Great. Now go back to the King James. And you see Paul giving us a doctrinal, I mean, a statement, doctrinal statement about godliness. Even though that's not what we're looking into tonight, it, it will help us just to touch one or two things there. I mean, just give you doctrinal statements, powerful statements, which should be studied one by one for themselves. What exactly did he mean? What I'm trying to get into is the practice of godliness um, tonight. But, I mean, you, you must understand some of these things. Look at what the first thing he says there. He says the mystery of godliness is great without controversy. Number one, he says God was manifest where? in the flesh. Now, as simple as that statement sounds, it is one of the most powerful things you can ever read in the Bible. God himself said in the Old Testament, he said, if any flesh should see me and see my glory, they shall die. It was impossible. Are you following what I'm saying here? That even when Moses said that I may see your glory, God said, I'll put you in the cleft of the rock somewhere. I'll pass by, proclaim my name, proclaim my goodness. You will see my backside because nobody can see my face. I leave. Even when Moses went into the mountain, you remember how that God said, you must, put, you must cut down the mountain. Do you remember that? Cut down the mountain. Anybody that comes too close will die. That's how much God was to be feared, how much, I mean, the, the, the presence and the power of God was something just to be observed from a distance. The Bible says that people saw it, some people actually broke through the mountain, touched the mountain, and they died. Remember the ark? Uzzah was just trying to help the ark. You remember that he was about to fall off, touch the ark, and what happened? The Bible says he was struck dead. Now the Bible then comes and says God was manifest in the flesh, which means with Jesus, something changed. That it becomes possible that the human flesh, what you call flesh, can actually embody the entire fullness, potentialities, and possibilities of God. So he tells us in Ephesians, the third chapter, he says that we may know the love of Christ that passes all understanding, the length, the breadth, the depth, the height, thereof, and all the rest, and that we may be filled, not with a fragment, are you following what I'm saying here, but with what? The fullness of God. Somebody then comes and says, well, but you know he's talking about the body of Christ in general, that that fullness is in the body of Christ. I always say to people this, that do you know that if Jesus dies today and only one person says yes to his lordship. That one person is the body of Christ. So in a sense, you are the body. Is somebody getting what I'm saying here? Yes, Which means if only one person responded to the message of the gospel, do you know that the body of Christ is intact and whole in the earth? God is not going to say he's a deformed body. It's not the numbers that makes it the body. It's the belief. 
It's not how many people say, oh, I believe. And uh, um, it's not the numbers, a thousand people, a million people. Then we say, we have the body of Christ. No. What makes it the body of Christ is that you received a message, you believed it, and by the regenerative work of the Spirit, now you have the capacity to embody the fullness, the full potentialities of God. Is somebody following what I'm saying here? So when Paul was writing here, you may think this was just a casual statement. In John the first chapter when he says that, and the word was made flesh. You really think that they were just referring to basic things. I mean, the word was made flesh and the flesh dwelt amongst us. You, I mean, for us, it's like the word was made flesh. That's good. The flesh dwelt among, the word dwelt amongst us. That's good. Then they said, we beheld his glory. And the glory that we beheld was as the only begotten of the Father, not a measure of it. He was full of grace and truth. And hear this. He's saying to us that what was of Jesus is now our testimony. Is somebody getting what I'm saying here? So he says, hear this. Before you talk about anything godliness, this godliness we're talking about springs forth from a body of truth. It's, if you don't have this body of truth, what you have is legalism. It will be the human effort to try to come into acceptance with God. It will be human effort to try to be pleasing unto God. But there's a body of truth. Once you understand it, he says, hear this, we're talking about godliness, first statement, God was manifest in flesh. So God can be manifested through my mortal body. Immortality swallowed up in mort uh, mortality. Swallowed up in immortality. Are you getting what I'm saying here? I mean, I wish we had all the time I, because these are doctrinal statements and that's not what I want to do tonight. The next thing he says, justified in the spirit. Powerful statement. Justified in the spirit. What does he mean when he says it's justified in the spirit? Which means the statement and the fact of your justification are spiritual. And that there is nothing natural that has the ability to undo what... Is somebody getting what I'm saying? Discharged and acquitted in the spirit. Is somebody get what I'm saying here? So I can take those facts and those statements to deal with whatever is happening in the natural. Justified where? In the spirit. Is somebody getting what I'm saying here? He tells us that this godliness we are talking about springs forth from a certain body of truth. Let me show us something. Romans 8. Let me, let me just quickly show us this here. Romans chapter 8. I want, to see, I want you to see how powerful this thing is. Romans chapter 8. And I can tell you for free. You see, when the Lord began to deal with me about this, and as I was studying it, I realized that I don't think we actually have proclaimed with boldness and confidence the true possibilities of the gospel like it should be proclaimed. I don't think so. What, listen to me, what we have done for the most part is to proclaim the liberty or the freedom that the gospel brings. And that's powerful. But there's an empowerment that the gospel brings. He brought them out. That is liberty and freedom. That he might take them in. Redemption is not complete simply because you came out. Is somebody getting what I'm saying here? That's why I would say to you that Jesus looked at the woman who was taken in, I mean, and, uh, taken in the act and all the rest. And he looked at her and he said, go home and sin no more. And if you look at that statement, you say it's an instruction. How can you tell a woman who was taken in the act, go home and sin no more? You are an unjust person to tell somebody to do what you know they don't have capacity to do. You are holding them against a law that you know you have not empowered them against. Are you getting what I'm saying here? You are saying go home and do no more. And you know in yourself that she's going to go home and do the same thing that you have said. For Jesus to be justified in that statement, that statement must not just be an instruction. It must be an empowerment. Go home and do no more was not just an instruction. In, from inside that statement was an empowerment to do no more. So true grace is pardon and power. Two sides of the same coin. Is somebody still here tonight? Please, we are building up. And I really want us to get this thing. Because what I found out is that, and if, if we are going to be sincere with ourselves, you will find believers who have struggles in their lives. Genuine believers. Sincere. I mean, I'm not saying that they, they, they don't like God. They love God. Sincere believers. Sincere leaders, actually. Sincere workers. 
but struggles in their flesh, struggles in their life. And then they get to a point where there's a sense of, well, listen, I know I'm forgiving of God. And there's almost that, that resignation that as long as we are in the human flesh, then these are things that we will have to struggle with. Hear me. Hear me and hear me well. Whatever was paid for on the cross should never be a struggle in your life. Whatever was paid for on the cross should never be a struggle in your life. Look at Romans 8. I want to show something very powerful there. Romans chapter 8 from verse 1. And we'll come back to this Romans 8 in just a bit because it answers Romans 7 where it says the things I, I don't want to do, um, I find myself doing. And people use that to teach some funny things and all the rest. Because there's no Romans 7, Romans 8 in the manuscripts. It's the Bible writers that put it in chapters and verses for ease of reference. So the statement he was making from Romans 7, the last four verses, continued in, the conclusion was not in Romans 7. The conclusion was in Romans 8. And save that you read Romans 8. If you stop at Romans 7, you will have a partial truth. Are you following what I'm saying here? Now look at Romans chapter 8. It says, there is therefore, now this is a powerful statement, confession to make together, I believe so. Let's make this confession out loud, one to go. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Can we read verse 2 together, one to go. For the law of the spirit of life. So it means a law. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin. So there is a law of sin and death at work in the world. It says, but the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has now made me free from the law of sin and death. Now, I hope you know that this is a statement of fact. It is not necessarily a statement of experience. And that there are facts that are, I mean, shown us in scripture, but not necessarily the experience of every believer. Are you following what I'm saying here? That whilst this cannot be changed, and this is true, that the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death, a believer can still be under the law of sin and death, not because he should be, but because he doesn't have light on this subject. Is somebody following what I'm saying here? Now, but there's something I want to show you here. Hear me and hear me well. Hear me and hear me well. Tonight is the end of every struggle. I'm telling you the truth. I'm telling you the truth. What the Lord is doing is to present unto himself a church without spot and without blemish. A church without spot and without blemish. That's what the Lord is doing. A church without spot and without blemish. Look at verse 3. And you see something very powerful in verse 3. Verse 3. It says, for what the Lord could not do, why couldn't he do it? In that it was weak through what? The flesh. Please look at it here. Look at what he's saying here. He says the law was weak through the flesh. So the inhibition or the problem was what? The flesh. Then look at how God responds here. Very powerful. Look at the next thing he says. He says God sending his own son in what? The likeness of what? Sinful flesh and what? For sin. What did he do? condemned sin in the flesh, which means he gained decisive victory over sin in the flesh. Is somebody following what I'm saying here? Yes, Where did he gain decisive victory? Where, listen, and the reason why this is important is that he's showing you the possibilities to you. God made manifest in the flesh, condemned sin in the flesh, which means we're on this side of eternity waiting for that, absolute, that final glorification where the church is caught up with the Lord and the mortality is swallowed up in immortality, waiting for that experience. And then you are saying in your mind, oh, you know, as long as we are human on this side of eternity, what the scripture says that true in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he says the son of God came and in flesh, are you following what I'm saying here? He took on the nature of Abraham. That's what the Bible says in Hebrews, the third chapter. He took on the nature of Abraham, blood and bones, flesh and blood, so that he can be a perfect sacrifice. So that sacrifice there was not a spirit that died. Are you following what I'm saying here? No, 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 no. Now, was it, did that body have a spirit? Yes. But it was not a spirit in that sense. It was a body that gained decisive victory. A body that was prepared me. Is somebody following what I'm saying here? 
which means that every believer can have decisive victory, absolute dominion over sin and all of such in their flesh. Condemned sin where? In the flesh. Is somebody following what I'm saying here? Now, if we don't understand this and we don't study how this really works, what then happens is that there's a lot of, you know, desire, um, excitement about God, and then you have a lot of, um, what's it called, um, guilt, shame, and condemnation happening in secret places in people's hearts. And then people who, and let me tell you how people get into trouble. When people don't have the working knowledge on how to gain decisive victory, and then they hear a form of truth that says to them that, listen, God loves you irrespective of what you have done, which is absolutely correct. Did you hear what I said? Irrespective of what you have done, the love of the Father is untouched, untouched, unchanged. You need to understand that. Absolutely correct. But then, and I'm going to come to you to let you understand the effect of sin. It's not the love of the Father that is touched. The effect, I'll show you in just a bit the effect that it has. Because when people say that, it is half truth. There's an aspect of your life that if you don't give attention to this thing. So what then happens is because people don't have this working knowledge, that sort of gives them some liberty in their heart. The guilt and the shame and condemnation towards God lifts. And they say, well, you know, God has nothing against me. But then God has nothing against you, but things are festering in your life. So you find people making those kind of statements, but things are still festering in their lives. There are addictions there, there are habits, and there are things that are going on that is not in keeping, is not in keeping with the message of the gospel that you have received. But then your heart is clear. You see, because if, if your heart condemns you, the scripture says, he said, God is greater than your heart. So when your heart condemns you, you run back to the message of the gospel. And then you say, well, God is greater than my heart. He's not holding anything against me. God loves me and all of the rest. And you are saying God loves me. And that is absolutely right. But weed is growing in your life. And all of a sudden you are finding out that God loves you, but the things he has desired for you are not coming. You are not entering into the fullness of what, of what he has for you. You are not experiencing God at the level that you should be experiencing him. Things are being sabotaged in your life. Is somebody getting what I'm saying here? Yeah. Things are happening and you know this cannot be the best of God. God loves you. Absolutely right. His love for you has not changed. Absolutely right. But there's a form of truth that brings you absolute victory. Where you can stand before God not in your own ability. It says this godliness springs from a truth. Is somebody following what I'm saying here? Yes, and if we are not aware of this, you see, I've said this over and over again. Satan is not an originator. He's not a creator. I hope you know the only creator in the whole universe is God. Yes, Men are not creators. We are innovators. Basically, something already exists and then you innovate around what exists already. The one that sits in that class by himself is God. The creator, Elohim. That's why in the beginning it says Elohim. The first, the first introduction of deity to mankind was creator God. The word Elohim means creator. That was the first introduction. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, I said that to say this. Satan has no original wisdom. I was explaining to you what, I don't know if it's here, somewhere. What sovereignty really means. When you say that somebody or something is sovereign. That sovereignty means that your thoughts are not gotten or influenced in any way from an external source. And there is no human on earth who can claim that sovereignty. There is no being in the universe that can claim that sovereignty. The only one who can claim that sovereignty is God Almighty. Are you following what I'm saying here? That's what makes, which means there is no thought in the heart of the Father that was injected from the environment, that was injected from somebody or an auto-suggestion or maybe because of a book you read and then your mind brings it back. Are you getting what I'm saying here? That's God in a class of his own. So what happens here is this, that everything you see the enemy do is simply an inverse of what God is doing. So when he says that, look at the enemy's kingdom, Ephesians 6, Paul explaining it. He says, um, principalities, power, rulers of darkness, um, spiritual wickedness. I hope you know that that's the structure of God's kingdom as well. If you study the angelic structure, that's the structure of the angelic kingdom. It's the exact same structure that the enemy took and inverted it for his own purposes. Why? He doesn't have original wisdom. 
Everything that he does is what to invert what God is doing. So you have what is called a mystery of godliness that is at work in the earth today through the believer and through the church. There is as well what we call a mystery of lawlessness that is at work in the world. Is somebody following what I'm saying here? Now, what do we mean by a mystery of lawlessness? Which means iniquity, Mark, Matthew 24, 12, it says that because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Which means the way and manner in which iniquity will be mutating and modifying will shock people. I hope you know that we are hearing things today that if 30 years ago you heard them or you saw them, you will literally think. This, are you getting what I'm saying? Yes, sir. I mean, literally. I would, I, mean, I, would, I would always give the example. I don't know if growing up, you remember how that you watch a movie and the man is coming close to the woman and the man is, you can see that he's making gestures. I mean, just maybe to give her a kiss or give her a peck. You remember how your TV would just go, shh, they will block everybody's face. Even you, before they do, you do like this. You do like Blood of Jesus. Now, but do you know what you do nowadays? Eh? You didn't even kiss her well. Uh -uh. Some people even have actors that they like because these ones know how to kiss. Believers, though. They say, the reason I like this guy, he embodies the role. Yeah, I mean, you can see that he has embodied the role. You'll be shocked at the things that have become norm to a generation. Is somebody follow what I'm saying here? that have become absolutely normal. Things that if you heard them 10 years ago, 20 years ago, you would have been shocked that this was a possibility amongst humankind. Can I tell you something? If you think that you've heard them, you say, ha, wait till next week. You hear, you will shout, ha, ha. By December, you say, hey, you will just faint. You know why? Because iniquity, there's a mystery of lawlessness at work in the world today. Which means people are only going to get more godless, more lawless. Iniquity will abound. I mean, everywhere you turn to will be... Are you getting what I'm saying here? I hope you know that things that you had to go and look for, that they, they actually come to your doorstep now. Things that you had to go... I mean, things that were not normal to be heard amongst human beings is what everybody consumes as a normal today. It's called the mystery of lawlessness. Let me show you something here. You see, because if we can contrast it, then you'll see what God is trying to do through the church. That God is trying to introduce godliness into the earth, into the nations of the world. He's trying to introduce, and we are not talking about believers just being in one corner and just being pious and being holy. No, we are saying that your holiness is a force. A sanctifying force. The same way sin can be a corrupting force. Righteousness can be a sanctifying force. Because if you are not careful, our ideology and our theology is that we hide in one corner and we maintain ourselves unspotted, unstained by the world. You know, let's be careful so that our garment is not stained till we meet our bridegroom. No, 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 no. Righteousness is a force. Are you following what I'm saying here? The godliness is a force. The same way sin can corrupt, righteousness can be a force. Look at 2 Thessalonians. Let me show you something here. Let's look at a few scriptures around this idea of the mystery of lawlessness. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. So that you see what the enemy is doing. And what he's doing is simply trying to corrupt what God is doing. You know, Satan has, does not have absolute knowledge. But he can read signs and times. They saw the star. There was an interpretation that the king shall be born. But they didn't know exactly where the king will be. You remember that? If he knew exactly where, then Herod would not have asked that, go and look for him. When you find him, come and tell me. He just knew that there's a star. There's a, the Messiah had been born. Are you getting what I'm saying here? And then what did he do? He started creating situations in the environment that if you don't have the background, that the reason children are now dying, in Israel, and they passed a law, is because a star has appeared, a baby has been born. You will just think that it is the government that is a bad government. Do you understand what I'm saying? Imagine that you don't have the back knowledge that Jesus was born. 
You don't have the back knowledge, the inside information that the star was seen out there, up there. Are you following what I'm saying? You don't have that inside information. And you are just an Israelite. All of a sudden, they sign a law and they say that every child below three years of age must be killed. And do you know what you would have said? What kind of terrible government? What kind of problem have we? What is happening in Nigeria? Darkness and address. But do you know that that's a reaction to something that's happening in the realm of the spirit? Now, believers many a times don't know that what is going on around you is a reaction. You really think that the reason there is war in Ukraine and all, you think it's just because people are angry and fighting. That Israel, you know, sometimes many believers are not sophisticated enough to know that you may not see exactly the trigger, but everything Satan does is never an action, it's a reaction. Never an action. Did you hear what I said? Never an action, it's a reaction. Which means if you can pin something to the enemy, he's reacting to something in your life. So you say, ah, all of this, I do, look at what is going on in my life. Look at the problems that I'm facing. There's a reaction to something that is coming. Did you hear what I said? Yes, you say, ah, blah, 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 I mean, my business failed. Everybody has left me and not dressed, not dressed. Satan does not have the capacity to act of himself. Uh -uh. He reacts to what God is doing. That's what happens there. So you have a mystery of godliness that was unleashed the, that is unleashed through the body of Christ, and I'm going to show you how that works. Satan is reacting to that with what is called the mystery of lawlessness, which means before the church catches up and the church is able to fulfill its mission, we are going to destroy things as much as we can. Is hey, somebody following what I'm saying here? I hope you know that getting people saved in this generation by itself, and please don't mistake in what I'm saying, by saying it's not enough. I'm not saying that salvation, salvation is enough, Christ, and all the rest. But I hope you know that, that somebody gets saved is not enough right now because of the kind of exposure that people have had before they come to salvation. When Jesus stood by the tomb of Lazarus, he said, Lazarus, come forth. And the man who was four days, de four days dead came forth, bound hand and foot. And I've told you over and over again, if you asked everybody there, was Lazarus alive? Yes. But the living man was bound hand and foot, then he turned to the people. It was not Jesus who loosed him. He turned to the people and said, lose him and let him go. So loosening is in the hands of teaching ministries. It's people that lose those that have been raised from the dead. Are you following what I'm saying here? So you have believers that have been raised from spiritual death, but because they've not been exposed to the right teaching ministry, they are still bound hand and foot. Is somebody get what I'm saying here? So you find somebody who has been introduced to dangerous kind of information. Their minds entirely messed up. That they come out here and declare Jesus as Lord does not mean that in that moment their mind is fixed. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? So Satan is saying even if you get them saved, before you catch them, I will mess them up. And sometimes in church, you are trying to straighten people for 10 years. Listen, I'm a pastor, I know what I'm saying. I know what I'm saying. That sometimes you are trying to straighten people that the issues you are dealing with is not what you are looking at. It's what had happened in secondary school. What happened when they were growing up? Satan planted things along their way. He knew at some point that light will prevail. But before light prevails, let me destroy as much as I can destroy. Is somebody following what I'm saying? Listen, that's why believers need to rise up. We need to create environments where truth and light can be sponsored aright. Do you know? Listen to me. Even though this is not what I'm teaching tonight. But do you know that when Jesus rose from the dead, do you know the first people that got the message into town? It was the soldiers. They were paid to go and tell the people that Jesus did not rise from the dead. It was his disciples that stole it. In essence, false information and wrong message actually is more sponsored than the gospel. It was after that that the women now went to say, listen, he rose from the dead. But they had paid people to go and give the wrong information in town. This is what is happening today. That you will find out that the truth is not as sponsored as it should be. And that the wrong things are the ones that are being sponsored. Believers need to arise. Are we still here? So we have a mystery of godliness. You, still, you may not understand exactly what I'm talking about here because I'm going to explain to you what God really wants to do. He wants the church to be a force of light. The Bible says shining forth the light, holding forth the light in a crooked and perverse world. Holding it forth. 
in a crooked, in a perverse world, in a generation where everything is dark and not holding forth the light. That's what he says. Is somebody getting what I'm saying here? And so what is Satan doing? As God is working on the church, the enemy is working over time with what we call the mystery of lawlessness. Are you following what I'm saying here? If anybody told you 30 years ago that they will sign certain things into the laws of nations, you will never have believed. That you will go to school and that a six-year-old is allowed to decide whether she's a cat or a goat. I don't know if you understand how terrible the world that the things that we are faced with in the world today is. A six-year-old, you, are, you, are, you, are, you have to sign as a parent and say that this person is allowed to decide whatever. I'm a cat, so I'm now a cat. I'm now a cat. You hear things and you're wondering, how did, how did human beings come to this point? It's called the mystery of lawlessness. It's a mystery. Things will get dark and dark and dark and dark and dark. There's some information that filtered into the environment last week or two weeks ago and all not. And people are saying, ah, is this possible? It's the one you saw. It's the one you saw. I hope you know that that's the list of everything. It's the one that... It, Amen, amen. <laughs> they said somebody did not go to prison in this country. He was supposed to go to prison. He went to a house. They locked him up in a the house. They were giving him food. After six months, he came out and all dressed. You think he's an ordinary eye? The people that are driving the best cars in town, you don't know the things that are going on behind closed doors. And believers are just very oblivious, non-sophisticated. They don't understand that. That's why a believer will enter into politics and you are wondering, is this a believer after six months? Yeah. Genuine. Have you met believers who, before they entered politics, they told you, I have a heart for the people. I want to change people. I want to do this. They are the ones that eventually become the most corrupt. It's called the mystery of lawlessness. Darkness everywhere. Is somebody following what I'm saying here? Yes, sir. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Let's run very quickly. Oh, God is raising you as a force of righteousness. Oh, that amen can be better. Yes. I said, God is raising you as a force of righteousness. Yes. Look at from verse 1, and I want us to follow the thought here. It says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. Now, very quickly, our gathering together unto him is not meeting in, um, what's, this, what's the name of this place? Somewhere in VI. Our gathering together unto him, that's not what he's referring to. No. If you study it in scriptures, it's not referring to church gatherings. No. This is an eschatological text. So the, the discussion is about the coming of the Lord. And in this case particularly, um, he, he, he goes between what you call the second coming and the rapture of the church. You see, because the rapture of the church and the second coming are two separate events. We can't go into that now. But then uh, you have to study in between the lines to know exactly what he's talking about here. But when he says, our gathering together unto him, he's talking about the rapture of the church. That Jesus will appear and the church will be gathered together. Are you following what I'm saying here? Unto him. So he's talking about that event. And then he says, before that event happens, look at this here. Is somebody learning anything today? It says that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Now look at verse 3. It says, let no man deceive you by any means. So deception will be a big deal in the last days. All forms of truth and doctrine everywhere. Then it says, that's why the Bible talks about doctrine of devils. I will come into that as well. It says, for that, for that day shall not come, it says that day of the Lord will not come until something happens. Please, and I want you to underline this in your Bible. It says that day, the rapture of the church will not happen, will not come until this event happens. And what is the event? It says that except there come what? A falling away first. Say with me, a falling away first. It says, and that now, two things. There will be a falling away first, number one. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. 
And then you read in the next verse what is called the mystery of lawlessness and all of that. So what is the mystery of lawlessness trying to do? It's working its way to the revelation and introduction of the Antichrist. What is the mystery of godliness trying to do? Working its way, are you following what I'm saying here? Until the return of the Lord Jesus. Two parallel events happening at the same time. Each one fighting for what you call market share. Are you following what I'm saying here? And, and this is a slap on, it's not the exact way to put it, because, I mean, the gospel cannot be fighting for market share with lawlessness and address, but that's pretty much what it is. That Satan is working over time, knowing that his time is short. Are you following what I'm saying here? Iniquity multiplying, using everything to leg, make iniquity legitimate. Are you get what I'm saying here? Make it logical, not just legitimate, but logical. That people get to the point where things that you condemned before and you knew were wrong, it becomes logical. That's why Paul writing to Timothy, he said, not only will they be deceived, he says, will they deceive? He says, they will now be deceived. That people will come to the point where genuinely they actually believe so. They genuinely believe that it's not male and female alone he created them. You, can't, you are wrong to be saying. It's not that they are trying to be bad people. They genuinely now believe it because they've come to a place of deception. Is somebody following what I'm saying here? So you have that mystery of lawlessness at work to introduce and, and, and bring a revelation, a manifestation of the Antichrist. And then you have the mystery of godliness at work till the church I mean, um, um, is caught up with Jesus Christ, the revelation of Christ, and, and all of that. All of those things are working together. But he says that one thing that is going to mark, please stay with me, the rapture of the church before it happens is that there will be a falling away. Now, when you read falling away, what you think is that some people will backslide. Uh-uh. That's not what he's talking about. The Greek word is actually a military term. It's called mass mutiny. You know what you call mutiny in the army? Which is that younger soldiers, lower ranks, other ranks will rise up against higher ranks. And they will say, we don't like what they are doing. And try to take the power from them. It's called mutiny. Are you following what I'm saying here? So he says that there will be mass mutiny, which means entire nations, please stay with me, entire nations, not just individuals, nations, societies, organizations will rise up against the authority of God. They will rise up and say everything that God said is right is wrong. It's a mass mutiny. If God says it's male and female, we are telling you it's 30. There are 30 different kinds of gender. If God says that marriage is for man and woman, we are telling you you can make up your mind for whatever you want. If God says this, we are telling you this. Mass mutiny, and it's going to be sponsored with, um, with policies, it's going to be sponsored with government backings, everything. It's not just sin that somebody stole an address. We have gone past that. We are talking about Satan entering into places of power and raising nations against God. Where an entire nation rises up that was built on the Bible and says, take the Bible out of schools. Take prayer out of schools. Don't mention Jesus in your songs. And believers are just there, okay, I want to buy the next car. And what you don't realize is that they are willing to give you the next car with a credit card while they take your life. So he says that day shall not come. And hear me, when Paul was writing this, I can tell you for free, his people were telling him that, how, do you remember they were under Herod? They were under Roman occupation? So how can you say there will be a mass? They will look at him and say, what is, what is Paul saying? What, is he Herod we want to fight? He was speaking prophetically about the day and time in which we live in today. That a day and a time will come where people will revolt against the authority of God. Is somebody following what I'm saying here? Now look at what he says will happen next. He says, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. But before the man of sin is revealed, everybody read verse 4 and the next verse there. What does he say? Who opposed and exalted himself above all that is called God. Everything God represents, he will oppose it. All of a sudden, you find out that, I mean, in states in Nigeria, there are legislations against where churches can be built. And the other faiths, they can be built anywhere. You think this is normal? Is somebody following what I'm saying here? Look at what it says. He says, who opposed and exalted himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God seated in the temple of this. Listen, if I had the time to explain this, this, this is a dangerous statement that Paul made here. He said, he seated in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. 
that the zenith and the height of this thing will be that there will be an entrance into the church. But I don't want to get into it tonight. Hmm. Is somebody still here? Now look at verse, let's jump to verse 7. Or let's, let's read from verse, verse 6. It says, and now, you know what we told there that he might be revealed in his time. Can we read verse 7 together? One to go. Very powerful scripture. What does it say? For the mystery of iniquity. Hold on. Change it to lawlessness. Newer translations actually use the word lawlessness. It says the mystery of lawlessness dot what? So what is working in the earth today? The man of sin is not yet revealed. But what is in the earth today? The mystery of lawlessness dot already work. It says only he who now let it will let up. Put in another way, only he who now restrains, the word let there is old Anglo-Saxon um, way of saying restrain. Only he who now restrains will keep restraining. And who is he that restrains? The church. Until he's taken away, talking about the rapture, he's still referring to the same thing. It says, only he who now let it will let till he's taken away. It says, and then shall that wicked be revealed, on and on and on and on. So you have what is called a mystery of lawlessness. Iniquity will just keep abounding. Are you following what I'm saying here? Yes, Everything, you, I mean, you will think that you've seen the best or the worst, pardon me. And then you begin to see a lot more. Look at Romans chapter 1. It's the same thing Paul was speaking about in Romans, the first chapter. Romans chapter 1. And if you don't understand this ministry of lawlessness, that's why you find somebody, a well-meaning believer, very well-meaning believer, who had no plan to ever lift his hands up to, to hit his wife or anything, if you asked him, he, 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 he meant to be a loving husband. Are you getting what I'm saying? Yes, he didn't go into marriage saying, I will cheat on my wife. Are you following what I'm saying? Yes, All of a sudden, you find well-meaning believers returning with stories that they, they are so broken, they can't believe that I am this person. A young man came to meet me many, many years ago. He had just finished a seven-day fast. Very sorry story. Very sorry story. He had just finished a seven-day fast. And from the fast, as he was going, he saw um, a lady dressed, I mean, you know, a sex worker, whatever it is. That's where he ended, from his seven-day fast. Seven days of waiting on the Lord. That's, where he, that's, that's how he, um, do you get what I'm saying? That's where it ended. And he, 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 was so, he couldn't believe, he couldn't believe himself. You find somebody get a job and they have, they have all hopes and all dreams that, you know, I'm going to be here. All of a sudden, they find out that they have joined the wrong group in the, in the workplace. They are now the ones cutting corners. And one day, the person sits down and says, is this me? I never, are you following what I'm saying here? You have believers who sit back and look at their lives and they say, if they told me 10 years ago, this is what my life will look like. This will be my conduct in the secret place. I would have said it's a lie. Which means this thing is not waiting for your permission. Any excuse possible. Are you following what I'm saying here? Any excuse possible. A good guy just goes to work for whatever reason. He's, he, he did not have a good time with his wife. They are not in good mood. Somebody says something. Everything starts spiraling down from there. Are you following what I'm saying here? And he finds himself in an amorphous relationship that he could never have believed a tongue-talking brother. You know, because sometimes the way we look at these things, we, we think of it as though people premeditated. And our, no. There's what's called the mystery of lawlessness, which means like they use in street parlance, if you lose God small, it will just hold you. Palm is by, you are like, what has happened here? How many of you have been in a commuter bus before and you found yourself swearing for a conductor? You, 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 or you were driving on the road and you say, waka, waka. And as you did waka, you, you, you're an usher. The person you ushered on Sunday just drove past. You say, ah, brother Prista. <laughs> Are you following what I'm saying? Let me tell you this. You will be shocked at the capacity you have to surprise yourself. You will be shocked. That's why it says, let him that thinketh he stand. Take heed. Don't stand and be throwing chest everywhere. Take heed, lest he fall. If, if, it's not, if it's not the fact that this thing, there's a possibility inside to fall, he will not tell you to take it. Are you following what I'm saying? Here? Which means you are, you, it's not premeditated or anything, but there's something at work in the world system. 
something at work in the world system. A gentleman is driving on the road. He turns his head. He sees a lady dressed in a certain way. And for three days, that image cannot leave his head. He's praying in tongue. And it's almost as though you really think that is, you think is what the lady wore. No, 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 no. Satan has taken an image to sponsor it, to develop something inside. You find loss just growing in. Are you following what I'm saying here? You f- and then you find people just coming together and somebody says, I, I know who I am. And there are things that are springing up in your heart that you are not decisively dealing with. But today is a day of deliverance. Look at Romans chapter 1. Let's run through this very quickly. Romans the first chapter from verse 21. It says, because that they knew not God, they glorified, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imagination. Their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise. Have you not found out that the, most, the wisest people are the ones who say rubbish the most? I mean, they speak a lot of phonetic and English and others, and others, and others, and others. And by the time you hear what they are saying, it's so anti-God and makes no sense. And then I find believers who take this posture and say things like, oh, you know, I mean, we are, we are, we are not a violent people and others, and others, and others. Let me tell you something. We don't force our faith on people but don't force your values on me. When believers take that posture of it's okay for them to force their values on us, we are not rising up as the church that we should be. No. We have a responsibility to hold forth the truth of God. We have a responsibility. Not this chicken attitude of as long as I'm fine in my own corner, then I'm okay. No. Like I always say to people, you know that when they crossed over Jordan and Joshua took over the, um, the ministry from Moses, Remember what Joshua said to them. There were two and a half of the tribes that had received their inheritance on this side. And the remaining tribes had not received their inheritance on this side. And then Joshua said to them, he said, those of you that have received your inheritance, please cross over the Jordan and fight with your brethren that they may receive their inheritance. And the implication of what he was saying was very simple. If your brethren don't receive their inheritance, the enemies that are left there will come for you. In essence, your safety is not that you alone receive your inheritance. Are you following what I'm saying? So somebody says, hello, I'm fine. Oh, me, I'm okay. Oh, everything is good. And we are sharing testimonies of I got a good job. It's fine. I've bought a brand new car. I built a house in VGC. Now I have a house I'm building in Lekki. Blah, 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 blah. And everybody is sharing all those kind of testimonies. I hope you know you're not the one that will teach your children in school. I hope you know that the teacher that will teach your children. I, do you know that if you had not been involved in God's program, some way, somehow, and this is how God does it. Please listen to me. That if you have been involved in his program, some way, somehow, you have sown seeds that will secure your lot. Some way, somehow, without you knowing it. You are just praying in the spirit. And God knowing that this will be your child's primary three teacher and might be a wrong influence on your child would have caused you to pray in the spirit concerning that person's life. Maybe the person will find the gospel or for some reason, they will move that person from primary three when your child gets there. You didn't know it. You were just in intercession. You were just responding to the flow of the spirit. Are you following what I'm saying here? But when believers are all in their own corner there, they say, at least I am my children, my house, my fire. And you are sharing testimonies. You don't know that your life is a part of a bigger game. It's part of a bigger ploy. That you can control some things, but there are many factors that you don't have a hand in. Is somebody follow what I'm saying here? And if we're not careful, we, we are just praying about our breakthrough. We are praying about our increase. We are praying about this and all dress and all dress. We are praying on... Let, is it not Paul that said, pray for the nation that you are in? Pray for the peace of that nation. That you may live quiet and what? Peaceable lives. Which means God can bless you and there's a lot of prosperity in your life, but there's no peace. Your life is not quiet. Because the blessing is inside a land of trouble. Are we still here tonight? Go back to that Romans 1. Romans chapter 1. Look at verse 22. It says, professing themselves to be wise, and I'm taking my time to go slowly around this so that you see the implication of what's going on in the world today. Very soon, you, you will remember I told you, you will come out on the street of Lekki, it's naked people that will be walking. I know many of you are saying that. It's not possible. It's not possible. The one you said 20 years ago has not happened. I said, it's not possible. It's not possible. Has it not happened? 
You will go out, you, you have what they call nudist colony. They will say, listen, we, 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 we can do whatever we want to do. We are okay. Nobody can tell us to wear clothes. Nobody. You, you will come out on the streets of Lekki. You will be telling your children, close your eyes, close your eyes, close your eyes. You think that everything is normal. You think, you think people are okay. You think everything is normal. Satan is working till he brings depravity at the worst. Till he destroys everything of glory and value in mankind. He's working hard. Are you still here? The church has to rise up. The believers have to rise up. And where does it start from? From our personal lives. This light must shine into our conduct. Whatever has not influenced us and changed us cannot change our world. Are you following what I'm saying here? So whilst the immediate focus right now is your conduct, whilst that's what we are looking at, the influence of this mystery of godliness on your own life, the fact is that this thing has an influence on a global scale. Are you following what I'm saying here? Look at what it says. Let's read the next verse there. It says in verse 23, it says, And change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man. It says, And to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Verse 24, Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness, through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own body between themselves. Do you see what's happening in the world today? All scripturally proven. Who changed the truth of God into a lie, worshipped and served the creature more than the creator, creator, who is blessed forevermore. Amen. Verse 26. It says, For this cause God gave them up to what? Vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men living the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men walking that which is unseemly, and receiving... Do you see that there's nothing you are seeing in the world today that the Bible has not told us will happen? Yes, are you getting what I'm saying? Yes, you can imagine that this was since the days of Paul. <laughs> receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was made, verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Reprobate means a mind that has gone beyond being able to discern between good and evil. The mind is so twisted that it cannot tell what is right or wrong again. A twisted mind. Now look at what it says. Being filled with all unrighteousness. Look at what Satan is trying to do. Fornication. Wickedness. Have you met wicked people? <laughs> We, are you following what I'm saying? Wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit. Is this Paul writing? Is it Paul that we are reading here? He's telling us the, nature, the state of the world. Is this backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affliction, implacable, unmerciful, who know in the judgment of God that they which commit such things are what? Worthy of that. Not only do the same, but have what? Pleasure in them that what? Do it. So the question is this. What is the, what is the possibility in godliness? Romans 6. I want to show you something here. Romans 6. We've looked at what the enemy is doing. But what are the possibilities in godliness? Romans chapter 6, verse 11. I want to show you something very powerful there. Romans 6, 11. It says, Likewise reckon ye <clears throat> also yourselves to be what? Dead indeed unto sin. Now this is a good confession to make. So let's read Romans 6, 11 to 14 together. One to go. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God. Verse 12. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither ye yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. With a loud voice, let's read verse 14 together. I want to go. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under what? Grace. Can we read verse 18 now? Let's read verse 17 down to verse 18. 17 and 18. Want to go? But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin. Do you see that? We were what? Servants of sin. 
What then does he say next? That form of doctrine which was delivered you. Now, please, please, with all intent. I want you to read verse 18. What does verse 18 say? Want to go? Being then made free from sin. Hold on. Being then what? This is what he has done. Am I right? Being then made free from sin, what happened? You became the servants of righteousness. Please underline that statement, servants of righteousness. Too many people are aware of being servants of sin. And that is where a lot of believers are. That we are servants of sin. Okay? So you hear conversations about addictions and habits. This is what has filled the, the possibility of the mind of believers. But look at what the Bible says. It says there's a way and measure in which you can know the truth of God's word and you are a servant of righteousness. Do you know how the Bible puts it? Every time he makes statements like that, he says much more. If sin had reigned this much in your mortal body, are you following what I'm saying here? In your mortal body to the end that you find your mortal body literally under an auto, auto suggestion, literally under dominion to sin. It's not a premeditated thing. Are you following what I'm saying here? Sin seems to have the clutch and rules as a tyrant over your life. Paul introduces another dimension of truth. That not only were we free from sin. This is what many people preach. People say we are free from sin. And as powerful as that is, he says that's not all. You are not just free from sin. Because what happened was that you were under a ruler. And that ruler was sin. He has made you free now. But freedom is not all that he has given to you. He says that you can come to a place in your life where you are a servant unto righteousness. The same way your bodies, your members were given as what servants unto unrighteousness. Your members can now be servants unto righteousness. Possibilities in godliness. Is somebody listening to what I'm saying here? Which means, please say this with me, in my flesh, there is decisive victory over sin. That's what Jesus said. That's what he did. He condemned sin where? In the flesh. In the flesh. We don't have to wait till we are glorified to that other side. Are you following what I'm saying here? No, you don't have to think that sometimes we fall down, we get up. Uh uh. No. A saint is just a sinner that fell down seven times. Where did you see that one in the Bible? No. That's not what the scripture teaches. That's not, that's not the reality of the believer. That's why it says, if any man sins, we have an advocate. He didn't say when any man sins. First John 2 1. If any man sins, if means that we are putting this provision in case of something that happens. When is we expect this to happen? Is somebody follow what I'm saying here? So the provision that he puts there and he says that confess your sins and all of the rest is if any man sins, we have an advocate. But there's a life that he has given to us. There's a way and manner in which godliness, this thing that he did on the cross, can be so alive and real to you that sin is decisively judged in your flesh. And I fear, listen to me, I fear that there are many, many churchgoers, many believers, ministers, leaders, workers, who subtly in their minds have concluded that we fall down but we get up. Is a normal thing. We just keep asking forgiveness of God. And because we have taught people that, listen, there's no amount of sin that we commit that will ever exhaust the love of God and the mercy of God. And it's true. There is no sin that any man will commit. No amount of sin. Are you following what I'm saying here? That can exhaust the provision of forgiveness, the love of God, and the mercy of God. No amount of sin. But I always explain this. That when you say that sin does not influence anything that happens between you and God, you are absolutely right. You are, you are absolutely correct. In fact, if God changes his mind and his disposition towards you because of your actions, then he's not God. Because God is love and agape love is unconditional. Irrespective, a God who died for us while we were yet sinners can't turn his back to us when we are sons. Are you following what I'm saying here? He can't turn his back on us when we are sons. So what is the impact when somebody says, you see, because you can say that, oh, my, my tire will keep busting and all the rest and I will keep fixing it. What is the impact on your journey? You are slower. Are you following what I'm saying? 
you will still get to where you are going to, but you will get to it there with a lot of trouble. You will get there with a, are you, hassles. Are you following what I'm saying here? Because the, the destination, God will never change the destination to accommodate your speed. No. He's not going to move it backwards. Is somebody getting what I'm saying here? That's why Paul writing, we have to put a balance. I told you there's a counterbalance to every truth. Yes, we agree and we say to you that the love of God is reckless, is overwhelming, is overflowing, and irrespective of where we find ourselves and whatever it is that we do, the love of God is available unto us. That is an absolute fact that must not be touched. But you need to understand what is the implication on your own life and your own destiny. For example, he says when people get into fornication, he says they sin against their own body. Who will forgive the sin against your body? Have you ever studied that scripture before? Because that sin is not against God. He says, listen, it's not just that they sin against God. You can ask for forgiveness for that, but who will forgive the sin that you have committed against your own body? Who is that person? You have to understand the implications of these things. So yes, I understand that your relationship with God is untouched and all the rest. I understand all of that. But it has an impact on your life and your destiny. So he says to us, I always say this, in a great house there are many vessels. He never told us how the vessels got into the house. Because the vessel has no, no impute in being a vessel. No vessel ever said to the potter, I want to be a vessel. No. Are you following what I'm saying here? How do vessels enter a house? The owner of the house goes to the market and buys it. That's what you call agorazo, one of the three words translated for redemption in the New Testament, which means you pay a price. Apolutrosis, agorazo, and lutron, three words. You pay a price, you go to the market, you pay a price and take that thing off the market and you bring it into your house. So the assumption is that if the vessel is in the house, somebody has paid the price. That's redemption. But then having entered into the house, he says there are vessels of wood, of clay, of silver, of gold, and all the rest. Then he says that some of them are unto honor and some unto dishonor. I hope you know that it's not the wood or the clay or the gold that makes it honor or dishonor. Absolutely, because he tells us what makes it honor and dishonor if a man purges himself of these things. In essence, a vessel of gold can be unto dishonor. If you put a vessel of gold in the toilet, that's a dishonor. Are you following what I'm saying here? Now, so then he tells us, he says, how then do we know which vessel is unto honor and which one is unto dishonor? If a man shall purge himself of these things, then he shall be a vessel unto what? Honor. Whether he purges himself or not does not change his status as a vessel. God will not remove the vessel because the vessel refused to purge himself. He will not. The vessel will remain in the house because redemption, he has paid the price and it belongs to him. But if that vessel will be a vessel unto honor, it is based on what that vessel does, not what the buyer did. Is somebody following what I'm saying here? So when we preach on one side that no matter what you do, you are still a vessel unto God, you are right. You, that cannot be changed. But the other part we must tell people is this, is that amongst vessels, there are vessels unto honor and some unto dishonor. And then he says that when you do all of these things, then you are fit, made ready, qualified for the master's use. Not for the master's love. The father's love does not require your qualification, but the master's use requires your qualification. Separate the father's love from the master's use. There are many people who are under the love of the Father, but are not usable by the Master. Is somebody getting what I'm saying here? May, and can I tell you this? This is why you can have increase in number in the body of Christ, many who are loved by the Father, but few that can be used by the Master. So you are wondering, where is the strength of the church? The strength of the church is the availability of vessels unto honor. Are we still here tonight? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So tell the person beside you, it's time to purge. Oh, yes, yes. Yes. We have something to do with our vessels. We have something to do with what, the, what is the character of your vessel. You have, it's not the master. If a man shall purge himself. If a man shall purge himself. Hallelujah. And God spoke to me. He said, men and women who have been under, I mean, earlier this morning, there was such a strong anointing of God's spirit. Men and women who have been under shackles and bondages. Things that you know that this is literally an obsessive force of the enemy. The power of God is made available tonight. You are going to walk out of this place a free man indeed. A free man indeed. Thank you, Holy Spirit. 
Let's pray. Can somebody get on the keyboard for me quickly? Is there a maker around or somebody or anybody, please? Quickly on the keyboard. Quickly. Get, please. Thank you. Please. Everybody pray in the Holy Spirit. Please pray in the Holy Spirit. Pray in the Holy Spirit. I didn't say you should whisper. Please pray in the Holy Spirit. Pray. Please pray. Open your mouth and pray in the Spirit. 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 Pray in the Holy Spirit. The same way sin has reigned in your mortal body, righteousness can reign in that body. That's what the Bible teaches. That our lives will be a reflection of what, what Jesus did on the cross. Will actually be a reflection of what Jesus did on the cross. The conduct and the character that is befitting of the gospel. Thank you Holy Spirit. In the mighty name of Jesus. I want to give us four thoughts. Four very important thoughts as we wrap up this evening. Four very important thoughts in practicing this godliness. Because there is a conduct that is befitting of the gospel. Are you listening to what I'm saying? Here? There is what? A conduct that is befitting of the gospel. There's a conduct. And having led for years... Um, I think you, as a pastor, as a leader, sometimes you just get to a place where you can't be shocked anymore. And you get what I'm saying? You just, I mean, uh, you can't be shocked anymore. But it's an unfortunate thing that we have gotten there. Are you following what I'm saying? It's an unfortunate thing. There is a conduct that is befitting of the gospel. Number one is this. And talking about practicing godliness. Number one is this. And this is where every practice must begin from. Align your thoughts with what Christ did on the cross. That's the number one. Remember I said there is a form, pure, true godliness that springs forth from what? This doctrine, this mystery. Align your thoughts with what Christ accomplished. What, what is called in popular parlance within the church today, the finished works of Christ. Align your thoughts. What has he done for you? It says, reckon yourselves now dead unto sin. Like I said, I don't remember if it was here. I was saying to some people, and I said to them, I said, if you find yourself struggling with any, any habit or whatever it is, go into the book of Romans. Go for one month. Declare a fast. Don't keep saying that I'm forgiven of God. Don't do it. Don't just, don't be comfortable with something he has delivered you from. Don't be comfortable. Don't just say that I know I'm forgiven. So it's fine. I'll be fine. No, don't do that. Are you following what I'm saying here? Don't do that. Remember, he, he brings us liberty and freedom. And not just liberty and freedom, empowerment. Those are the things that we should see in your life. You are delivered from the bondage of Egypt. And then we see the dominion of righteousness over that thing. Are you getting what I'm saying here? So don't be comfortable with it. What does the Bible say? It says, reckon yourselves dead unto sin. Sin shall not have dominion over you. Look at the things that the word of God says concerning that situation and make it your meditation. Hear me and hear me well. The word of God is medicine. And I always tell people that if it's small headache you have, they will say use 500 milligram. If it's big headache, big headache they will say 1,000 milligram. Am I right? Then they will say increase the dosage. They will say you see three twice a day. Ah, your own is plenty. Three times a day. Your own. Ah, you need it four times a day. Sometimes you know that what you are dealing with is not something that just five minutes of saying that um, sin shall not have dominion over me shall. Do you get what I'm saying here? There has to be that intentional effort. Desire freedom enough to pay whatever discipline that is required for it. Whatever discipline that needs to go into it. Don't be comfortable with a life that is shackled. Don't be comfortable with a life that is shackled. So align your thoughts with the provisions of Christ on the cross. That's the number one thing. What did he do for you? 
Romans 6 that we just read. Sin shall not have dominion over you. Stay in Romans 6, Romans 7, Romans 8. Stay there. In fact, you start from Romans chapter 3, actually. From chapter 3 to chapter 8. Stay there. Keep reading it over and over again. Make sure you don't leave your house without reading 3 to 8 of Romans. By the time you are at work again, make out time, read it again. You are reading it religiously, you are reading it routinely, but something is happening on the inside of yourself. Scriptures will start coming out. Start declaring them to yourself. I Sin does not have dominion over me. I am a servant unto righteousness. I yield my members unto righteousness. None of my members is yielded unto iniquity. You are declaring those kind of things. And you know why this is important? Because even if you fall off the track, and it seems as though um, maybe um, you fell into iniquity or sin, it is your revelation of what he has done for you that will keep you from guilt and shame. Are you following what I'm saying here? Because what Satan then does is that guilt and shame comes at you, and then you drop the treadmill. You step off the treadmill to say, well, listen, maybe it's just not for some of us. But you know that whatever, however long it will take, God will stay with you till you get it. That's number one. Number two. Please, number two is very important. Make a resolute decision. Make a resolute decision to live a life of holiness and consecration. Resolute. Did you hear what I said? What kind of decision? Resolute. Come to that place in your life. You know how people will say, it's either I have it or I don't have it. It's either this is there or this is not there. A resolute decision. I'm not playing around certain things. Certain things are not normal. Are you get what I'm saying here? Don't, you see, because if you're not careful, we live in a world where things have become normal. You find believers telling small, small lie here and there. Say, it's just small lie now. It's just small lie. Like I was, I was Bishop Edupa, I heard him saying something. And he was saying to people, he said, you're a businessman. And then you buy something at maybe less, I mean, I don't remember exactly the figures. But you buy something at 1,000. And then you say, I bought it at 5,000. He said, on just balances and scales. Why 1,000 to 5,000? Nobody's saying you should not make profit. But why is your balance so unjust? Why is your, you say, I ah, know it's whoever can pay it. Why is your balance so unjust? You are, you are a tailor, and, or if, oh, sorry, I mean, they have different names now. You're a fashion um, pundit, an address, and uh, whatever name it is. Do you get what I'm saying? Here? And then they call you, say, where's my clothes? You say, ah, I've just, I'm just, I'm bidding it now. You have not even cut the clothes. I'm bidding it. I'm, I'm bidding it. Ah, he, ah, auntie, if you see the clothes, <laughs> you, you'll be happy I wasted small time. I'm bidding it. And you find believers, one day an artisan was walking in my house and they called the guy, he was laying this, this kind of stuff and they called the guy and the guy said, ah, I'm on, he said, Alona, I'm on the way now. Can you not hear? And he did his mouth in a certain way. I'm telling you the truth. I, where I was, I said, God. And when he dropped, he said, ah, for me. As he, he was excited at iniquity. I know it's believers somewhere in our mind because of the legal system of the world where we decide that some things are capital punishment and some things are small punishment. So there's small sins. Say, I lie in a small sin. Now. It's, just, it's just small. It's just a little lie here and there. You know, sometimes I, my hand just is scratching me. I just pick things. Hallelujah. <laughs> Make up your mind. Did you hear what I said? Did you hear what I said? This is not legalism. This is you honoring the price that Jesus paid on the cross. Make up your mind. A resolute decision to live a life of holiness and consecration. Number three. Please listen to me. Oh. Practice separation. Did you hear what I said? Practice what? Separation. What do we mean by that? 2 Corinthians 6 verse 17. Practice separation. Paul said, come out from amongst them and be ye separate. Touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. Have you ever read that before? Practice separation. Don't say to yourself, it's fine. I can just watch anything. Do you understand what I'm saying here? I can just read anything. This, this, itch, this desire to read and to see and to hear is where people get into problems. You are too much of value to read everything. You are too much. Imagine that we put, we put 
we put a basket here, an offering basket, and people start putting biscuits, um, paper, and everything inside. How do you feel? Do you know that same basket can be the basket you're using for dustbin outside? But because we have put it here in front, and we've called it an offering basket, you feel a certain way that somebody will put their waste inside. You are God's vessel. While other people are outside and they can put junk inside them, not you. You can't watch everything. You can't go everywhere. If somebody listens to what I'm saying here, don't say, ah, you don't know me, man. You don't know me. No. Evil communication corrupts good manners. That's what the scripture teaches. You can't watch everything. There are WhatsApp, people's WhatsApp, there are friends of yours on WhatsApp that you know you need to mute their status. You don't need to see what they are writing. You don't need to see what they are putting up. It's feeding something in you that's not bringing edification. Is somebody following what I'm saying here? Make up your mind. Tell the person beside you, practice separation. Come on, tell the person again, please practice separation. Number four, maintain a highly charged spiritual routine. Highly charged spiritual atmosphere. Psalm 119 verse 9, how shall a young man, wherewith shall a young man cleanse his ways? By what? Keeping your word in his heart. Maintain a highly charged. This is so important. Many of you will agree with me that moments where you have stayed away from the presence, and I'm talking about practicing the presence of God, you become vulnerable to certain things. It can be as simple as you just find that you are cranky. Let me put the converse. How many of you have found yourself in a tough situation and all the rest and you are weighed down? But then you come into church like the kind of worship we just had now and all of a sudden you are worshiping and the burden lifts up. Joy I mean, comes up on the inside of yourself. How many of you have had those experiences before? What happened in that place? Did your situation change? No. The presence infused you with something that you could use to face the situation. So what happens when we stay away from that presence, you will find out that the strength and the wherewithal, the very things that you, you naturally would have said no to, you would have had the ability to resist. Are you getting what I'm saying here? The things that you would have been able to say, I mean, this, this, in fact, will not be a temptation as such. All of a sudden, you find out that it becomes a temptation while you have stayed away from the presence. And everybody, please look at me. Many people come to church. Few people stay in the presence. Many. You will be shocked under heaven if I took a roll call here and asked people, in the last one month, when did you sit down before the Lord? in one hour of just praying in the spirit and meditating on the word, that you may have less than a 10% of the church, you will be shocked. That for the most part, what people will do is join a prayer altar and be saying, Amen! And be driving to where they are going to. And there is absolutely no fellowship with God by themselves. So you find believers who are involved with all forms of spiritual things, but there's no strength, no stamina on the inside of themselves. Why? They are not practicing the presence. Maintain a highly charged spiritual routine. Did you hear what I said? What did I say? Hi highly what? Do you know why it must be highly charged? The environment in which we live in is highly charged too. Highly charged. Just go outside, you will see everything. Highly charged. Carry your phone. Highly charged. We cannot afford to have a less charge. We can't. So you are driving to work, Hira, Ba, Bora, whether you feel it or you don't feel it, highly charged. Words of confession on your lips, whether you want it, whether you feel like it or you don't feel like it, highly what? Charged. Highly charged. This is so important. Practicing the presence. Highly charged environments of, of, of prayer, of meditation, of worship, are you following what I'm saying here? And ensure that people around you, they feed that thing in your life. Not, hey, have you seen this thing? Ah, may I send you the link? Wait, I did come, I did come, I did come. Just hold on the line. No cut, no cut, no cut. I did check him, I did come. Eh, eh, eh. You don't see him? Now the link be that. Oh, yeah, yeah, call me back. Check him. And you, everything you are checking has nothing to edify you with. Nothing. You don't need that company around you. Are you following what I'm saying here? You don't need that company around you. Highly charged. Highly charged. Let's pray for a minute, please. Let's pray. Let's pray. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. 
Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you for the work of your spirit in our hearts and our lives. Hmm. This is the mystery of godliness that God manifests in the flesh. God manifests in the flesh. God manifests in the flesh. Put another way, God manifests in your flesh. 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 I sense the need for us to pray a bit, just a bit, just a bit. And a couple of things will happen as we pray. A couple of things will happen as we pray. There's going to be a staring. There's going to be a staring. The chains that held bound will break. The chains that held bound will break. The Lord is saying to me as well, there will be a change of appetites. A change of appetites. There are people that have fed themselves with the wrong things for so long. But tonight, there's going to be a supernatural work of mercy. A supernatural work of the mercy of God. A change of appetite. All of a sudden, the things that you had an appetite for is gone completely. It's gone completely. If you can stand up, please stand up. If you can walk around, please walk around. Don't be casual with the prayer. But most importantly, take a prayer posture that helps you pray. You want to kneel down, please kneel down. This is a matter of destiny. Holiness, consecration, godliness. It's not so that we have something to stand before God to boast where of. No. It's a matter of destiny. Somebody pray out loud in the Holy Spirit where you are. Pray out loud in the Holy Spirit. Number one, the Lord said the shackles that bind, they are breaking. They are falling off. They are coming off. Number two, the Lord said he's changing appetites. 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 The Lord is changing appetites as we pray in the Spirit tonight. Remon Tavele Kwashtala Bandi. Serotana Baba 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 Shataka Baba 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 Takabaya. Soratana Mante Velo Shana Mante Kebahaya. Now there are those that need to seek the face of the Lord in repentance. There are those who know, believers, who know that you literally, literally turned your back on the things that you know. And you've made a practice of sin in your life. This is not a matter of, oh, you need to get born again. No, not that. It's the fact that you know better than this. And you've allowed the enemy walk through your flesh all form of lasciviousness. You've allowed the enemy run rampage through your flesh. I want you wherever you are to begin to pray. There are those who need to seek the face of the Lord for mercy. You need to seek the face of the Lord for mercy. You need to seek the face of the Lord for mercy. You need to seek the face of the Lord for mercy. God is speaking to me about one, two, three persons like that under the sound of my voice. You just throw caution to the wind and you've lived life as it comes. You've lived life as it comes. You've thrown caution to the wind. You hear things about consecration and holiness and it's a matter of, leave me. I mean, uh, God, I'm forgiven. But you know tonight that you're making a decision. A decision for holiness and consecration. There is something Jesus did on the cross that has given us the capacity to live in absolute victory over sin. Ranene mo shaba baba bae Sora ni go talamande velo takabae Sora mante ke velo atenengo shaba baba baba You are holy cuz you are holy Oh Lord God of oh my Sora bate la bashande Shana mante velo cobra digo skora mande Come on, with a loud voice, pray in the Holy Spirit wherever you are. With a loud voice, pray in the Holy Ghost wherever you are. With a loud voice, pray in the Holy Ghost wherever you are.